I remember the first time I read C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, and I was just shocked. I was shocked because of how honest and brutal it was. A Grief Observed is a book that he wrote in 1961, shortly after the death of his wife, Joy Davidman. And it is a haunting expression of grief, sorrow, and lament by a person of faith. And what's amazing is that Lewis, through lament, brings his full self before God with brutal honesty. Listen to what he writes. He says, grief is like a long valley, a winding valley where any bend may reveal a totally new landscape. Now, Lewis's lament is actually an expression of his faith. It's the pouring out of one's deepest fears, anxieties, and sorrows before the face of God. So lament is not a lack of faith, but the expression of it as one is tossed about in the valley of the shadow of death. And the book of Habakkuk is structured in the beginning as a lament or as a complaint. The prophet Habakkuk, like Lewis, wrestles with God's purposes in a tragic world. He's a prophet, which means he's a spokesperson for God. But what's odd about Habakkuk is that his audience is not Israel or the people of God. His audience is God. He's actually beseeching and going before God himself. He's talking back to God, or rather, he is initiating a prayer and a lament before God. And what's amazing is that God himself answers. And Habakkuk walks the long valley of grief and finds, hidden beyond the shadows, a new landscape of hope. This is Understanding Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk is about enduring faith under pressure. Habakkuk writes during the last decade of the 7th century, when Assyria, uh, Israel's longtime nemesis, has been dethroned. So if you remember some of the earlier episodes we did with the Minor Prophets, Assyria is the big bad guy. Well, at this point, Assyria is no longer the, the, the king of the hill. They have been overtaken by an upstart empire called the Chaldeans, or as they're commonly referred to, the Babylonians. Babylon is the new kid on the block, the new king of the hill. And Israel has gone from the frying pan into the fire. Assyria, their enemy, has been defeated, but a greater, more vicious enemy has taken its place. And Habakkuk is left trying to discern God's purposes. So as I read Habakkuk 1, pay attention to the way that Habakkuk lays out his case before God. This is Habakkuk chapter 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men, whose own might is their God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You, who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. 
Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Habakkuk's complaints express his faith. I mentioned that earlier in the introduction. Now, that might sound strange because we often think of lament or sadness or complaining to God or or laying out your heart before God as an expression of doubt. And you don't really believe God is good or he's going to help you or any of these things. But this is not really the complaint of an angry teenager, you know, who's bitter at God or somebody who's just uh, superficially saying, my prayers don't work. This is the faithful and godly man wrestling with a spiritual crisis. And even though he appears maybe even irreverent or maybe even blasphemous, if we pay attention to the actual way that Habakkuk speaks, we find both deep reverence and brutal honesty. It is a reverent complaint before God. Now, he doesn't sugarcoat Israel's situation. They really are surrounded by a terrifying and powerful enemy bent on their destruction. That's really happening. And if God, the just and good Lord of all, were to ever flex his power, this would be the moment. And yet it seems that he has refrained from this action, from saving his own people. Now, not only does God refrain from action, but he himself is the one who has raised up Babylon against Israel. Now, we're going to get into a little bit of a debate over the proper reading of Habakkuk chapter 1. And the traditional reading is that Habakkuk's first complaint in verses 1 through 4 is about Israel's wickedness. So Habakkuk is seeing the corruption and idolatry of his own nation, and he is wondering, God, when are you going to bring judgment? When are you going to discipline them? When are you going to defeat the enemies within Israel? Now, that would mean that verses 5 through 11 are a response by God to that direct complaint. Uh, You you might even see in your Bible, it says the Lord's answer or the Lord's response. And his response would be this, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians against Israel. Okay. Now this sets up Habakkuk's second complaint that God's solution seems worse than the original problem. I asked you, when are you going to destroy the enemies within Israel? And your answer is, I'm going to bring enemies from outside of Israel against Israel. Why are you doing that? Now, I think that that's a legitimate reading, the traditional reading, but I'm not fully persuaded by it. And the reason I'm not persuaded comes from Thomas Renz, who wrote a commentary on Habakkuk, and and he points out this, that the content of verses 5 through 11 doesn't really work as an answer to Habakkuk's first complaint. First of all, it's addressed in the plural. Now, think about this. Habakkuk is one man talking to God with a complaint, but then God responds in the plural. That doesn't seem to make sense. So it can't be that this prophecy or this response from God, if it is a response from God, it can't be a direct response to Habakkuk's question. And the fact that he says, I'm going to raise up Babylon, again, it doesn't even answer Habakkuk's question. So that's why there's some doubt over whether this really is a response from the Lord. So if it's not really God responding to Israel, what is it? And Thomas Renz has this interesting uh, way to read it. He basically says this, verses 5 through 11, what in your Bibles says the Lord's response or the Lord's answer, is not really the Lord speaking, or at least not speaking directly to Habakkuk. What it is, is a prophecy by the Lord that Habakkuk is quoting. So the reading would be this, verses 1 through 4, Habakkuk is not complaining about Israel's wickedness, But Babylon's, he's saying that Babylon has surrounded your people. Babylon is persecuting and attacking and causing harm to your people. And then he's quoting an old prophecy of how God promised that he was going to do that, how God said that he would raise up the Chaldeans, which is, that's another way to speak about the Babylonians. He was going to raise them up against Israel. So he's saying, this is what's happening now, verse one through four. And what's happening now is a fulfillment of what God told us back then, the prophecy quotes in 5 through 11. And that sets up Habakkuk in his second complaint to say, God, I know that this is part of your sovereign plan, but I'm not quite sure how the math works. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how this all checks out, and I'm struggling to reconcile this present situation with your 
eternal character. But it's important to note that the prophecy that Habakkuk is quoting recognizes that it's not Babylon pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps or their, their own military might that is giving them success, but rather it's God himself. And here's the logic. If God is the reason for their success, he can also be the reason for their downfall. And we can see Babylon's success. We can see kind of the turmoil where, where Habakkuk is like, Lord, you're the holy one. You're, you're righteous. Uh, or, or we're not going to die, right? Uh, but when I look around, it seems like we are. And it's very strange. I mean, he says Babylon is kind of like a fisherman with his hook. You know, he's hooking all these fish left and right. He's uh, swooping them into his, uh, his net. And he's having a feast and living in luxury and whining and dining and all this stuff. And instead of giving thanks to God, even for his military victories, he thanks uh, his own pagan gods. Or he actually uh, sacrifices to his fishing net. And it shows that Babylon isn't even, uh, they're, they're just a, a godless pagan nation. And it doesn't make sense why God is letting them have free reign. Now, this teaches us two important things about lament. First, lament is honest about reality. Habakkuk doesn't resort to trite platitudes, but he lays out the urgency of his circumstances. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? It's a pretty honest take. He's looking around and he's accepting reality for what it is. But second, lament is theological. It's not just pouring out every you know, feeling that you have. It's not just an outburst of emotion, but it's actually a way to embody and to wrestle through your own theology. This is where the rubber meets the road. Habakkuk begins by working from his circumstances to God, okay? But he ends with working from his theology, his knowledge of God, down back to his circumstances. And here's his conclusion. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. So Habakkuk is saying, look, I don't really know what your plan is, but I know what it can't be. It can't be an evil plan. You are righteous. You are good. You are holy. Maybe this is a, a tool of correction. Uh, maybe this is discipline on our nation. I don't know what it is, but Lord, I know that you are good. Now, Habakkuk knows that the fate of his nation rests in the hands of of a righteous and holy God. And this is the foundation of his hope. This is the exercising of his faith in the character of God. Faith in a God who promises never to leave or forsake his people. And what might seem like an irreverent attacking of God's character or a doubting of God's goodness is met, surprisingly, by a response from God. In chapter two, God does address Habakkuk directly. And his answer is pretty shocking. <laughs>